Well, good morning, everyone. I'll open the uh, planning and strategy committee meeting. The recording has started. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, firstly, apologies. We don't have any apologies. We're all here. The conflicts of interest based on what's on the agenda. Um, no public forum. No matters lying on the table. I'll move that the agenda be confirmed without alteration. This is Gavin Second. Any discussion? All in favour? Carried. Confirmation of the public minutes of the last meeting held on the uh, 30th of February 2024. Two minor corrections. To the spelling of my name on pages six and eight. <laughs> <laughs> Did that on purpose to see you earlier? Yeah. I only looked my name. So, how yeah. long? Yeah. Six pages, six and eight. The bottom six and eight. Bottom of both pages. Oh, yeah. Garrett. Any other? Edmonds? No. So, we'll move that they. Uh, Public meetings on the 30th of February 2024 be confirmed for a record. Moved by Gavin, seconded by Melissa. All in favour? No. Okay. okay, item one, which is a uh, strategy and policy. Thanks, Michelle, all your team. Really, uh, really appreciate such a Comments for a board, fair bit of stuff in there. I'm thinking about this afterwards that we most probably need to. I'll have to advertise the other councillors to have a look at this uh, agenda item. And uh, uh, if they've got any questions, they can forward them through to me. We'll, we'll go from there. But work our way through it now. Just uh, see if the agenda item it covers off on the uh, priorities then of the actual further down in the uh, summary report. Is, uh, so I've got notes on sort of both areas, so we'll just work our way through it. Uh, first of all, we'll cover off on the uh, status of the uh, plan. You want, I'll over to you, Michelle, or whoever wants to talk to it. Um, we're effectively taking the report to Brent. Anita gives her apologies today. She's on leave. Um, but I'm joined with Gabrielle Marsh, our programme manager, um, and Liz Simpson and um, Andy Owen, who are both strategic planners looking after the future development strategy and housing. So really, if you have specific questions, these one subject matter experts will be able to, to answer them for you. Well, as the... Um only, okay, some of the, some of the uh, timings may be a little because uh, things have moved on a little bit. Um, so, is there anything in particular you think needs to be highlighted that's changed since this report was written, or we just go straight into it? Is there anything no. that um, we had um, in terms of the um, structure? planning for the Southern Corridor. We had the transport workshop yesterday. Okay. Um, so that, that is new information that wasn't included in the report. Um, so that was the first of the, the series of workshops that we will be having on the Southern Corridor. Okay. We might come back to that and see if there's any more questions or see how that went. Okay, yeah. sure. Okay, so we're on page uh, uh, 14, this is the status there. We've got uh, some of the actions highlighted with Amber and Red Stavis. Have we got any questions on any of that before we go to the report? Matt? Um, just a, a general question about the extension on, on some of the timeframes with economic, economic diversification plan, the Blue Green Network. I was wondering what the, the, um, the delays have been, has it been resourcing, has it been sort of timeframe expectation of those things? Yeah, so in terms of the economic diversification plan, um, my understanding is that it's just due to being able to go out to the, to the um, community to do in stakeholders for that, more of that consultation with the community um, right. and the stakeholders. So that is why it's been delayed. But the diversification plan is in its final stages. Um, it's primarily yeah. to be um, getting the all the code signatory organisations, the timing around take, going to relevant board meetings and other council meetings and other groups to say, for them to say, yes, we'll put our logo on the front page and we will sign up with support to get from the diversification plan. Um, that process is probably taking things a bit longer than was anticipated. Sure. Um, but it will be come, the intent is for that to come to council for, um, it's actually not, it, it's not coming to the 6th of June full council meeting now. It's 1st of August council meeting. But there will be another workshop for councillors um, in the interim. Right, yeah. 
um, and in terms of the um, Blue Green Network, um, we just we've organised a third Wananga with Kaitahu to work through um, that process with them. Um, so that is um, happening um, next Tuesday, um, and so things should progress after that. But we just wanted to ensure that we get, we we had that opportunity to, to work with them on that. So the interesting thing there with the Blue Green Network, as well as that the um, the calibre of the work that's been provided um, marks a significant um, uplift for us as we go forward in the way that we think and work through um, the values of Mantahu in our work. So it's, it's been it's a really interesting area for us to explore and it needs a little bit more space to be able to do that really effectively. So what do you mean by significant uplift? What do you, what do you... Well, it's in the sense that this is a piece of work where we've, we've been working in partnership alongside Nantahu on it. So in terms of significant uplift, it's more the insights and the expertise that our own staff will need to build into their own professional capabilities. Okay. It's not, it's not, um, it's not a financial impost or an additional workload or anything like that, but it's just a, it's a, a new way of thinking for some of our team. Okay. The uh, Howie Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, I know you've got all this updates in here and some of this will have these most probably be questions on design that would go to the Infrastructure Committee, but uh, is it, are we there any indication of, uh, are we talking about designing, are we still talking about designing the, what we understood was the current plan or are they looking at revisiting the business case for the you know the extent of the redesign work? Okay, right. leave that with uh, I, I can't the detailed design that. on the current plan. That's not what I understand. Okay, right. The uh, housing business capacity assessment, which we just covered more detail later on. That's to what the question: Who's actually doing that? The H, the uh, consultants or the team. Yeah, who's, if you engage the consultant, who, who is it? Yeah, so it's um, predominantly being run by Ali's team, and Ali's team, have, the work's been split slightly, so um, they're underway, we're underway with a model being produced for us to own internally. Um, that should be completed by roughly June, we should have a draft model. Um, some of the delays relate to the LTP, so part of the work that informs the HPA is the LTP because that basically tells us if we've got any infrastructure constraints going forward over the sort of next 10 year period. Uh, and that's really important for us to feed back in terms of the NPSUD requirements, because if you have any shortfalls due to say plan enable capacity or an infrastructure constraint and it's impacting the supply to be able to meet your demand, and then you're supposed to go, you have to then go to the minister and to inform them of those constraints and also then to design a programme to try and move beyond that. So getting that work is in, done correctly is really, really important. Yeah, I realise that. So I'm just trying to understand the importance of it. And that, so you've got an internal one, but you also got an external consultant helping out. And, to build the model. and we'll hear about that from Alison later. Okay, no. right. Any questions on that? Um, Probably just a brief comment on the monitoring report. I mean, and I've said this about some of these previously. There's the RAG status track alert system I find to be not particularly helpful because we uh, understand there's obviously a lot of depth and complexity behind these things and that, that green doesn't, from what I know, the green doesn't really, really mean green because uh, we know there's a lot of issues like in the background or that, um, Sometimes I find they're understated or certainly not complete in their in their expression around when you're only dealing with a red, orange, green um, type approach. So I just would like to somehow just signal that. And so I think we need to signal a little bit more that what what issues are in place for some of those projects because well i think we green should is. see that in the commentary yeah. uh, the green is it's a governance tool to be able to skate at certain altitude to understand through the document of how things are tracking the yeah. green relates it's important to remember that the green relates to the agreed milestones in the project so there may be things that are a frustration for different aspects of the program um doesn't necessarily mean it's off track mm -hmm. so that that's important to bring it back to and this is obviously um a key governance document that goes to steering group for the spatial plan and the political governance group so this serves a number of purposes yeah, yeah. um so you know i think it, it would be, we're always very happy though to take questions and to provide additional detail on projects of specific interest so that for council forum we're able to actually reflect that but obviously we don't rewrite this document for every forum yeah. that we take it to um, yeah. 
in the parameters or the um, reg status are at the, at the front of the document as well, so then be clear as to why you've landed on certain things that the project owners have to yeah, fit within that criteria. So that's consistent. Okay, but thank you, Chair. Um, the visitor levy, I see that it's way in there again, uh, and it states that the new government is yet to advise its position. Um, knowing that the government is probably unlikely to go down that route, have we got anything or any other angle that we can sort of tackle this? Well, I think the, the thing to remember with this delivery is that the, the public media position of the government is not always necessarily reflective of other conversations that happen. Um, so whilst there have been various individuals within the government that have made bold statements around their support or otherwise visiting levy, um, you know, it there are conversations do continue. So whilst we're waiting to get any sort of certainty, not all doors are closed, that's for sure. Um, and there are conversations around visitor levy in various forms that are still continuing across sectors and in conversation with government. So it's, it, it's not a dead duck, I think would be my <laughs> official advice. Um, so we, yeah, we're continuing to keep pressing on that door. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, that came up later on too. It talks about alternative, we talk about alternative funding. Uh, and I, you know, we've got to watch, uh, like I say, the mood of the government and what's happening in Auckland, uh, with Wayne Brown, about the GST on rates and things like that. I was wondering, we haven't got that in here, but uh, we haven't actually started that as a council. I don't know whether the mayor is pushing that or not, but uh, I don't know whether we should be starting to feed that into this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, that was the the alternative funding sources that are available to us, uh, on the one hand, seem extremely limited, but on the other hand, there's lots of things on, that seem to be on the table and in play at the moment. Um, we've moved from a space where it felt like it was only us who had that um, infrastructure funding challenge into a space where post three waters reform um, is now across the whole sector. So it probably has changed the nature of the conversation and there are alternatives out there that we need to incorporate. Okay. Um, there's quite a bit on the needs. Uh, I don't know further on. It. Just uh, anybody got any questions on that? I was really questioning the work out on that and the how binding some of the deeds are. Uh, we, we understand there's a fair bit of a direction going on about uh, Longview at the moment uh, and work going on there with that developer. Have you got any comment on uh, on how we, how successful we'll be with all these deeds, with the outstanding deeds? Sure, I mean, uh, so as mentioned here, there, there are actually quite a few different days that we're following up and monitoring, and most of them have been um, compliant in other way and successful. There are a few that uh, we are needing to follow up in a bit more detail. Um, the, at this stage, there isn't too much that we can add um, in terms of detail beyond what's in the report, because we're in the process of following that up. Um, but in particular, the Monica deeds, um, so that's the um, Valentine's uh, investment, downtown road industrial and the three parks. Um, that's been our first priority at this stage. Um, we also have the Jacks Point one and the Longview Hardware one. And as you've seen, there's, there's been a bit of follow-up about that as well. So I think it's worth noting that um, yeah, this is uh, Emily's role. How long have you been in position? Um, some months. Yeah, <laughs> we're talking a few months. Um, but it's a role that's been able, being able to put some real focus on this. And some of these are quite long standing. Um, so, you know, there's long backstories to them. So it, it's a matter of um, now just really keeping on top of these on a very regular basis. So we're hoping to see that we get a bit more traction quite quickly. Yeah, I just wonder what the mood is like there because, as we know, we're pushing ahead with the inclusionary zoning. You know, just had the hearing of that and a lot of kickback from same developers that we're trying to get deeds in place with. So I just want to as an indication for them that they're not willing to pursue too much more of that. I wouldn't say that. I think that um, particularly for the, so with the deeds, there's the community housing contributions, which is the sections and um, financial contributions that have gone to primarily the Queenstown Community Housing Lands Trust. And then there's the affordable housing um, provisions, which are actually a bit different, and that's about the prices that the houses are being sold. And we're seeing very good compliance with the community housing contributions, and that's what the inclusion rezoning um, proposed plan changes about. So actually, that's been very successful. Um, there are, as I say, a couple that we are following up, but by and large, the, that has actually been very positive. And through the hearings, we did also hear um, that they, they called it the voluntary process as opposed to the new one. Um, there was reasonably good support and understanding about that process and acceptance compared to, um, you know, the, as opposed to the new change. 
So I, I wouldn't say that. The um, long view one is about the affordable housing divisions. Yep. Um, so it's a little bit different, um, and you'd see how we're following that up. Yep. Barry. Sorry, the Chair, just a question. Are the, are the deeds a legally enforceable document, or are they a goodwill? <laughs> There's a good question. They are legally enforcement, uh, enforceable, however, each one is a little bit different and they all have slightly different clauses and follow-up mechanisms. So we're working with our legal team to understand exactly what our options are for the best ways to move forward with those. Um, so, for example, um, the Wanaka deeds that I mentioned, they provide the caveats on the land, um, the other ones don't. You know, so there are different options for each one about what's What's the best way forward in terms of encouraging and, and requiring it compliance? And in the first instance, I think it's important to note that we're working with the uh, people involved in the deed um, to try and discuss and understand the best outcomes we can get. Yeah. Okay, just uh, just going through the uh, the report then, planning the uh, lakes spatial planning. Monetary report. Uh, just on the uh, intensification variation, they're putting a summary of the uh, well, submissions, I guess. And you know, just wait for this for you or for Alison? Alison, Alison mm -hmm. okay. Right, I'm sorry. <laughs> Provide priority development areas. I was interested in this. Uh, You've got Wanaka Town Centre, the three parks corridor, some of Wanaka, and it's yeah, indicating what's intended there. We for priority development areas. In. I think they're, they're, those um, six areas were identified in the spatial plan back in 2020 as being priority development areas for potential development, but the work on actually designing what those look like yet for Wanaka oh. and the Southern Wanaka area haven't started. Okay. So that's that's a structure planning process. Okay. We're obviously undertaken that part of the Ladies Mile and now we're doing to um to Tapua and Southern Corridor and then we'll be structure planning the rest of them as well. But I think what we'll do um with the spatial plan gen two, we'll spend a bit more time on prioritising which ones need to come first. I think we had five, six, we haven't prioritised them and that has made it quite tricky because there are a lot of work streams in all of those areas that are kind of moving um outpace essentially which uh, would be useful if all of them were ready right now in order to sort of inform them but they're not quite there but I know Ali's team is uh, undertaking some work in the Frankton area on the Remarks Park sort of ODPs um, and that will and what the plan is is that uh, our team will work with Ali's team in terms of looking at the uh, Frankton kind of structure plan or the sort of area plan alongside the work that they need to do for the um, ODP to PD code stuff. The, um, the three parks, one has obviously got a certain amount of inherent master planning to it because of the nature of the land holdings and things, but obviously South Wanaka is going to be quite disparate in terms of the ownership. <laughs> um, probably one that, I mean, that's quite an interesting concept. How do we how do we master plan that without sort of triggering a, a wave of development that we're not ready for in that area? Because we're quite frankly, we're just not ready for that, but we need to be ready for it through doing the master planning. So, um, yeah, so. So it would go South Wanaka. Uh, Stunham Road, um, you know, oh, all okay. that area behind. Um, yeah. Um, the river. To, Mostly to, to sort of in that Orchard Road, Stunham Road. Um. I think that's something we really want to do as part of the uh, next iteration of the spatial plan is looking at infrastructure and really prioritising the areas that where we, where council want to invest first, and that will be kind of based on costs and what infrastructure mm. we already have available. And um, you know, there may be if we over that sort of. 10 year plan in the LTP, I mean, that informs that quite well in terms of where we're ready to spend. And then you've got your 30 year infrastructure strategy, which goes a bit uh, further. So there'll be a kind of, kind of rolling um, iteration of spatial plan being informed by those documents and the spatial plan informing those documents as they come through. So it is a bit of a work in progress at the moment in terms of making sure that everything kind of meets up and um, works off each other. Yeah, the HBA is a big part of play of that too, I guess. Yeah. This, um, just one other question. So 
I think I'm normally I'm on a steering group for the spatial plan um, working. I, I just didn't, it doesn't appear that that we have had meetings where I've been involved in that. Um, I suppose these questions about prioritisation and stuff like that just bring up that question of how do we use that group more effectively and and well, actually use that mechanism that's in place already. Um, you know, it's obviously an ongoing piece of work and the interactions with the regional council and all that sort of stuff. I think we probably need to enact that working group and, and actually use it. Mm. Yeah, so we, we do meet quarterly with at the steering group level, um, which is that level below the, the group that you're at. Unfortunately, just with that new government coming through, they hadn't assigned the new ministers to us yet. So we were just waiting to hear back as to who, because we need them to be there for the quorum. Um, so once we get that, but that, that has been um, we had, Yeah, them. we had one meeting with Megan Woods at the beginning of the term, I think, but it was um, yeah. it happened since then. So. The, the new ministers, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some of the new ministers in place. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. But it, it, we're, we're pushing mild on that. I think we're very close. Um, and we're, we're trying to, well, we're actually trying to put some plan there to ensure that we've still got that political governance group convened. Yeah, so is this a cross party steering group you're talking about? Yeah, so basically, the, the spatial planning group has a, a steering group, which is senior level officers from various government departments, the ORC, Kotaku, and ourselves. Uh, and then there's the uh, political governance group, which is Mayor, Deputy Mayor from our side, Chair from the ORC, Senior Commander from Naitahu, and then two ministers, um, which previously was the Minister of Housing, Housing and, and Transport and Economic um, Development. Right, yeah, so it's. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, but um, because they've changed all the portfolios, it's not like a straight switch for somebody to step into. Okay, but it, it, yeah, I, I mean, even in the interactions between the regional council are equally important. You know, mm -hmm. as we move forward um, with the next spatial plan, I, admittedly, I know that mm -hmm. uncertainty involved there, but we still need to. Well, yeah. we've also um, we've had a couple of tried to um, create joint workshops between the two councils, which obviously quite a large coordination exercise. But they've been really successful in some of the initiatives that we've had. So we're trying to we're trying to make sure that we're joining up as much as possible. Um, but you yeah, right that this is at right level though. I mean, as I said, I'm nominally on something that I don't um, haven't had much exposure to um, in these things. So I, if I'm yeah, I feel like I need to be brought in the loop on some of those. That's at the most senior level. That's the group you're involved in. So if that's not happening, we need to be brought in on the other side. As I said, that's what we're looking to do. In the, okay. in the event that we don't get a ministerial decision quickly, we probably need another forum to convene those partners to ensure that we still connect yeah. the momentum and understanding, even if it's not a formal political governance group session. Um, I might just add to that. So one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is putting a plan together for sort of workshopping um, where we're at with the priority initiatives so far and whether we think um, whether they're completed, whether we think they've been successful, what we think could have been done better, whether they need carrying forward into the next generation of the spatial plan, what might need to be amended. So um, just sort of going through that process and getting that organised, but that will lead to a <coughs> workshop where we'll all need to sort of sit down and discuss that. Yeah. So and it, yeah, moving forward, clearly things like if and I, I, it's a big if things like city plans and city deals and things like that come on the table, but that working group will be really important to, to align the priorities of the different parties. I think it's important to know that plans. that's not a working group. That is our most senior yeah. school governance group. So it's, it's actually very, very senior governance activity happening. So there won't be a workshopping component to that. But yes, absolutely, that group will be informed in that, but you will know about it a lot well before you do in that forum if we're talking alternative funding arrangements because as councillors there will be a different well, conversation what to be had. Group yeah. should be doing. Well, so the, the workshop you talk about, who would that be with? Um, well it will start off with the kind of leads that have been involved in the priority initiatives to chat through with them and get their feedback. Then once we have that feedback sort of collated we'll be able to prepare a report on what that's all look, what that all looks like and then we'll be able to um, arrange for a workshop where we want to discuss those results and how we want to move forward. So okay. there'll be a number of layers to that. So obviously we're sort of working through two separate governance systems, um, one for the spatial plan and one for the organisation itself. So it's, it's a matter of making sure we're touching all the bases. And you're getting good response from the OIC working level, uh, operational level? Uh, yes, yep, yep. Right, any other, the 
just uh, down on the uh, Three Waters Better Off Fund, uh, talk about projects there. Let's try to, are you up to speed on what these projects are? Or should I be asking them straight? Okay. No, 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 please. This is a uh, <laughs> six-monthly six report now is due in July. Two of the projects are due to be finalised mid-24 and the final project commence in 2025. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of some better off funding, it helps contribute towards those spatial plan projects. Um, so that's your um, travel demand management, the, the business case the implementation of that, the Blue Green Network, um, some biodiversity plans, um, the structure planning of Ted Tapawa is being funded by that better off fund. Um, we've got the diversification plan implementation, the um, destination management um, implement, implementation or components of that. Um, and and the community um, partnerships plan implementation of that. So um, yeah, those, those are the programs that sit under that Better Off Fund. Um, so um, an update to that is all of them are, um, are underway. The only only one that hasn't had any expenditure thus far to, to date is the biodiversity plans. Um, they were waiting for that Blue Green Network um, work to be undertaken first and then due to capacity so that the team can move on to that, but there is a plan to spend that money um, uh, once once capacity allows. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but a uh, question on accommodation supplement, have we got any update on the government side about that? Or? Uh, there was a um, report back and the minister essentially said that he's asked, uh, they've asked their officials for advice about different options. Um, there was no commitments in there, so um, not too much of an update, but that is the next step in the process. So um, we're waiting to hear from our central government partners about what that advice looks like, um, and we'll let you know when we do. Right. Any other questions on the report? Um, yeah, it covers so much. Uh, <laughs> we come across all these things at different at different uh, yeah. committees and <coughs> workshops, but yeah, it's pretty good to bring it all together. Like I said, I'll need to uh, get it out to other councillors. Uh, Uh, page 32, we have to put in there creativity and cultural strategy. If the before the answer or what again should be the strategy. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Yes, no, just one actually through the chief. Um, back on page 28, it talks about the Jacks Point to Frankton um, active travel route. Um, and I know there's been obviously a lot of discussion amongst. NZTA and various people about where it's going to go, but I mean, it's basically the NZTA are responsible for delivering that. Is that correct? Am I correct in that? The, the first half of it, yeah. Right. Yeah, so from um, around the kind of like the park bridge area to, to the bridge is the part that we're, um, yeah. That's right. Because um, that seems to be the delay was, well, from what I've understood, is that the NZTA component of getting things underway is what's delayed it. and it seems like it's quite a important part of the network, especially you know, for the people that live out there. Um, yeah, that was highlighted at the pay tag last week as yeah. well. But that, yeah. Um, I guess the other question is how secure is the funding for that? Is it committed already? Because obviously things have changed with the new government. I'd, I'd have to find out for you because obviously it's there through Waka Kotahi, um, but my understanding is that they have done a lot of design work in that space, right. um, but because of the costings that came back, they've had to do a variation to that, right. um, and so that's, I guess, what they're working through. Okay, well, we're seeing them this afternoon anyway. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I've got a question to ask them already. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And just through the chair, I just want to recognise you can see the, the <coughs> amount of information in the report, the amount of work that's happening throughout council, being collaboration across council departments. And I just want to thank everybody in the team and across council for the massive amount of work that's happening and showing the maturity of QLAC moving forward in relation to planning for all these things is something that we haven't done historically. And there's a lot of work we put into it now, and it's really good work. So congratulations for everybody involved in that. Yeah, I think it's really good the way. 
all comes together in your area, because like I said, this it goes into all, all the other areas of the council, uh, and to bring it all together, uh, I think it's very useful. Hopefully it's not creating too much work getting this report for the meeting, because you've got it up and running, and I guess you just now keep updating it. <laughs> oh, it's a dream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, we, we, try to, we do try to keep it sufficient because we report into so many different forums. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, so this, but this, in this current format, it's um, very well. It's meaningful to the committee. Okay. Well, I'd like to note the contents of the report. Something to see yep. Give it all in favour? Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Keith. Thank all right. Alice. Update on the progress of the proposed district plan and other key projects. It's a very good, uh, useful report. We've asked for and thank you very much, Alison, for putting it all together. Um, good morning, um, Chair Councillors. Yeah, this report is trying to bring together all of the work streams involved with the district plan review. As you're aware, um, some time ago, the council at the time embarked on a staged district plan review, which has made um, yeah, that process may be a little bit more complicated than if it was all done at once, but we are on that train and rolling through essentially. Um, as you can see from the report, um, I tried to pick up and illustrate um, to the committee, and as this is a um, report for the general public as well, just where we're at in terms of chapters of the district plan which don't have any outstanding appeals on them ones that we do have appeals that we're still working through. So we do, do still have some from um, stage one, but more stage two and three, but we're actively working on those now. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have on um, more parts of the review, but I would ask, unless in general terms, that anything in relation to um, Council and appeal processes in the Environment Court are covered in public excluded in terms of legal privilege. Thank you. Yeah, understood. I just, just uh, before we go to the questions, the, we're at the stage now. now. None of this has made, been made operative yet, has it? Um, no. I, I wonder I, what is the process for, I remember to ask you yesterday, but just uh, the process for making some of these chapters operative. Um, working through that at the moment. Um, done a little, well, a significant um, amount of work in that respect, checking through outstanding appeals that all specific points of those appeals have been resolved or not. We've got a really good list which has been checked by um, our legal team um, since in Grierson, which is great. Um, the next steps, and it sort of works in with what we've been doing with the e-plan, is um, looking to make chapters in whole or in part formally operative. So that um, has a number of requirements that we have to do in terms of public notice to the general public on what date that those parts um, have that operative status. Um, it's mainly a sort of mechanical exercise that we just have to undertake internally to make sure that we've done that forensic check and we're comfortable with what um, can be operative and what is still open to appeal. Um, and I have the delegated authority to make that call under the delegations register when we're ready to go. Okay. I'm hoping very soon. Okay, so then with things like the, you know, the outcome of, say, urban intensification and there's any changes, so if some of those chapters that will make you all made operative, then there will just be a change to those as they come through. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's it. How does this work? Because noting that this was notified back in 2015. Yeah. So we're almost 10 years of the review. So <laughs> once you make it uh, operative, do we start then having a staggered yep. ten-year review? <laughs> yeah, the clock starts for those provisions. For those chapters that are made so, operative. Yeah, ten the years. Year. Then we have to keep track of that, and that's a, <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, but it's it's done all the time. We did that for the last operative um, plan. It's a much simpler process now. It used to be that you'd actually apply apply to the environment court and with accompanying affidavits and all that sort of stuff. But one of the um, the updates to the RMA streamline that process. Okay. Right. 
we've got the tables in front of you. Questions for Alison? Yeah, when, just, and, and I appreciate that, that this is at a high level, just around the strategic um, outlook. So certainly appreciate that it, it takes an incredibly long time to review the plan and obviously with so in terms of stage three if you like the outstanding parts of stage three are there any bits to remain notified or just the the landscape schedules the outside that and stuff the rcls and that no um we st i think it's covered later in the report hopefully or somewhere there in terms of the um outstanding chapters which yep. are pretty much special zones that have yep. not been reviewed so that's yet. the final stage yeah so that's review. the final stage and also picking up um any land in relation to the gorge road area that's not subject to i suppose reasons. it was those ones that sit in between that i was interested in so um and i know some of them don't fit squarely into the district plan review but so where are we at with the notifications of the real character landscapes and, and things like that that are still yet to and I, I suppose the problem is that stage four if you like or the final stage of the district plan that's always been we're going to do that next year but it seems to be we've got so much left to do on those bits that are still there are we ever getting to stage yeah the final stage yeah um through this year at the moment we have um we are presenting to i think the early june full council meeting the landscape priority areas recommendation for um resolution as a yeah. decision so um once we've got that we will be double checking through all of the work that um the specific team has been working on in terms of the um, upper Plutha landscapes and we look to present that to the end of June meeting. So we've had that work sitting there for a while now, but we wanted to make sure that any of the outcomes in terms of methodology from the priority landscapes um, are taken into account for the upper Clutha before we notify it. So I think that um, there's a little, I guess, blurb on that on, at the end of page 51. So that work is still ongoing and in train um, in respect of the operative zones uh, within the team at the moment. We've set up a number of um, sub teams that cover all of those operative zones. One person with the responsibility with um, another two policy planners assisting. We're undertaking section 35 monitoring at the moment. Well, they'll um, be done in chunks, so will there be a section 32 report for every one of those special zones? There'll be a section 32 report for every one so of those, quite, but some of those will be um, quite consistent yeah. in terms of um, special zones that potentially all intents and purposes are functioning as lower density residential. Yep. So um, that's why we've got team members that are working across those so we can remain consistent. What we're working to do, given um, the issues with a rolling review, is um, is notifying all of those at the same time when we so get to it. The yeah. other current things that are out there, so obviously because it's a SPP or whatever it was, that we're not going to get, we're not going to be dealing with appeals on, on Ladies Mile. We will possibly be dealing with appeals on, well, most likely be dealing with appeals on inclusion rezoning and um, may or may not on landscape categories. Um, so there's yep. there's quite a lot of work for that. Yeah, this last bits, yeah. They, they are important in the sense that um, I'm constantly getting sort of approaches from landowners, especially in some of those areas where they're still in one ownership in terms of when are we reviewing those operative plans and bringing them into the proposed plan. Um, we made a decision at the time in terms of the intensification um, variation that we weren't going to cover the operative plan at the same time because it was just too big. It would have essentially been a review of pretty much most of our district plan in terms of all of the urban areas. So um, through the review of the operative zones, we'll be picking up the requirements of the MPCD in terms of policy five stuff like that. So we've got that sort of um, understanding and methodology of what we need to do. Just uh, following on, just 
for a uh, clarification, the landscape schedules, you've got to put down the bottom page 51, which you referred to, landscape schedules. Yes, and then, yeah. then up the box for the hearing that's just been completed, is this the landscape schedules priority yep. landscapes? That's another part of that. Yeah, yeah. it was a two-stage process, so essentially arising out of a decision, I think, of stage one of stage two of the district plan, the environment court says, we'd like you to do some more work in terms of setting up um, an understanding of the character of all of these landscapes and put them into two lists, essentially. The first one was the priority landscapes, not saying that they were any more important than any other ONL or ONF in the, in the district plan, but they were the ones that potentially um, more susceptible to development. So they needed to be done first. Um, and then we did the upper clother ones and they're waiting the wings. So they're two separate processes okay. using a similar methodology and similar um, experts. At the time, we just didn't have the resources, both landscape architects and planners, to do them all at once in the time frame the court required. So the uh, schedule's coming to the, are they still coming to the council? Yes, to... yep. The decision yes, for priority will be early June, which will be a decision for full council to accept the recommendation to notify as a council decision. And then the late June meeting, we will be bringing the upper clue for ones through to you for endorsement to notify. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Just on the inclusionary housing hearing, yes. uh, expert panel uh, reporters. Obviously not out yet. Do we have a timeline? Um, no, we don't. That is um, a part of the first schedule where they don't, uh, the commissioners don't specifically have a timeline. We just uh, like to require to make sure that we can still meet our two year time frame from notification to decision. So I'm aware those commissioners are working on that recommendation at the moment, but I'm not aware of a time frame that I'll be able to present that back to you as councillors. Um, okay. um, Sorry. Urban intensification, so yep. obviously a lot of work summarising those submissions. <laughs> yeah. um, are we close? Yes, we are okay. close. Next question is, um, it says notified for further submissions and people will have 10 working days. Given yep. the huge number of submissions, can we no. offer a longer time period? Here? No, that's one um, part of the Act where we can't use Section 37 to extend the time frames okay. on that. So it is a really tight 10 working day period. But given the amount of people that have submitted on um, that variation already, they're already in the process. Okay. So they don't need to, for instance, read through all of those submissions and make further submissions because um, probably in most cases they have um, read and understood the variation and they're in that process. It'll just be more people checking that their neighbours haven't sought to do anything. Oh, okay, so this is really looking for people who haven't made a submission that want to submit um, or not necessarily because there's some certain parameters around being a further submitter. You yeah. need to be either part of the process or have an interest greater than the public generally. Okay. So if your neighbour had submitted to increase their height through this process, then you could make a further submission because you've got an interest greater than the public didn't have in one. general. But yeah. if you're already in the process, you can yeah. do it to further submission. Yeah, unless somebody had said something that you hadn't thought about in your original submission and you wanted to either support an, um, uh, submission support or opposition. Given we can't extend that 10 working days, can, is it possible to give people notice of when that 10 working days will start? So rather than just go out with communication saying, yeah. here's the information, here's your 10 days, can we give like a two-week lead time saying, on this date we will release everything and you'll have 10 working days so people can prepare themselves or give themselves more time? Or? Um, potentially. We are working at the moment checking through the summary um, and there are a number of points there um, and we're hoping to go out on the 16th for um, to notify for further submissions yep. so we are um, yeah 11 days out from that now so yeah and I think we've got that on our website in terms of that particular page that we are um, going out so we can send everyone an email maybe because well, I'm not yeah, sure people are going to be checking you, you know yeah, like, no, we I, have, um, really yes that's it. definitely a possibility we can send I, it to our database that this is what oh, we're up to and this is what's and happening. this is when it's going to be released I think yeah. just giving given yeah. the amount of information that people are going to have to process and we can't extend that yeah. 10 working days 
if we can at least let them know that it's coming, it's coming. and yeah, then that's that's how long they'll have. Yeah. Otherwise, I can imagine there'll be a bit of, yeah. well, there'll be a pushback anyway, but just yeah. to give yeah. people as much information. Yeah, time for that as possible. Yeah, no, that's a bit. It's always thank you. it's always tricky because it, I mean it's only the volume of, and complexity of submissions that have caused the delay between the submissions mm. and the further submissions. Yeah. If it was straightforward, you'd actually do it within a few weeks, wouldn't you? That you'd yes. actually oh. support the further submissions yeah. straight away. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. yeah, and yeah, as you can see, because of the volume of work that we've got on the cards, the team has been summarising submissions alongside the normal workload as well. Yeah. So it's it's been a um yeah, a decent chunk of workload for the team, but they've done really well in that respect. Yeah. Matt, you uh, I just think he's through the chair. Um, do you mind if I jump ahead to other projects? Sure, go for it. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just reading on page fifty five here, um Kildy says commission to consult and develop a bunch of council new online interactive housing and business capacity and feasibility growth tool. Yep, that's the one we talked about earlier in the agenda with Liz speaking about, yep. How, how much do you see this, in, or do you anticipate this to be a really useful tool or is it sort of something that you need to do through compliance to show that you're... Um, both, yeah. both. What um, we've previously done in the past is had a tool that helps us, which is essentially a lot of spreadsheets, mm -hmm. um, looking at our capacity, what is, what we can do under, under um, district plan rules. What we're moving towards now is something that can be updated a lot more easily and can be, um, and can show visually where that capacity is and if we were making proposed changes, what impact that would make on a particular area. So it's using GIS as a tool a lot more than we ever have in the past. Right. So um, that process, and I guess that comes back to um, the question that you had of Liz from the first agenda item, um, the two teams have been working on that, on this um, HBCA. We went out to um, all of the market through GETS, um, well, early this year or late last year, basically um, asking who had the capacity to build us a model like this in terms of something that is a lot more interactive and easily changed so we can look at the effects of, say, um, funding infrastructure or plan changes or something like that. Um, the successful um, company was supportive, so um, Rodney Yeaman, and he is supported by Natalie Hanson, who's based in Wanaka, who worked on our previous one, um, in terms of that local knowledge. Um, he, uh, formative, have done a number of these um, models that are used by councils in other parts of New Zealand, such as Selwyn and Dunedin City as well. Right. So, um, they, is, this, is this being specifically designed for councils? Like yeah, that? to, to um, basically give effect or tick off what we're required to do under the UPSUD. Yeah. But each of the models has to be designed to the specifics of the district plan of the area and then um, information in terms of our infrastructure capacity, what we can and can't service, is one of those things that is built into it. That's why we're waiting for that June time period to know what is in and out of the LTP. Right. Okay. Um, the next stage of that process, and we've recently gone out for tender and it closes on the 13th of May, is for a consultant to write up the results of that model in terms of what it looks like, a hopefully user-friendly um, document that will help us in a lot of our work going forward, infrastructure provision, um, the next generation spatial plan. So it's going to be some pretty cool information in terms of our current and future capacity for um, housing and development. This is very bespoke sets for us though. This is for our council, yep. You can't sell it as a software system so they, to anyone no, else. No, no, and they've, and they've de um, developed it for us with our prereqs, but using a framework that they've used for another, okay. for other councils yes. around New Zealand. Right. Yep. So since you've the people who develop more don't actually write the you just have a different person write up the outcome of that model, is that what you're saying? Um, yep, but that person who's developed the model can tender for that as well. Okay. But we're just so making it fair to That's something that providers. would have happened yeah. other elsewhere in New Zealand, so there'd be people who have done that up there, but already. Um, sometimes, or sometimes there's internal capacity within a district council okay. to be able to write up the model, yeah. but we didn't have that at this point in time. 
Okay. We'd love to have some economists on staff, but we're not there yet. <laughs> okay. Um, you have got exciting news. You've got one new staff member coming. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, sorry. Yeah. Any other questions in relation to that or anything else? I can say that the um, e plan is now live. This was going to ask you to yep. talk about because. It's there. We'll talk about. So um, it's on our website. Um, yeah, looking forward to people having an interface, which is hopefully a lot easier to use. We've got um, a lot of communication on the website in terms of how to use it. There's how-to videos, um, and we've got um, sort of feedback loops for people that are using it, and if they have questions or potential things that we can do better, then um, we'll hopefully be able to improve that um, interface over time. But it's a really cool start Excellent. for the well, council. So pretty, yeah, pretty excited for um, for planned users and people just to be able to relate, go into using GIS, find their house essentially, and then easily know what rules, what zones relate to their property. Can something feel good at the weekend? Get the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Any other questions for Alison on this item? You want to I think just through the chair, hopefully this is a, a useful report. If you have any feedback on that would be appreciated. And I also have to say it will show you the mammoth amount of work that's happening within the team, uh, along with the collaboration integration of the parts of council, as you've heard prior to this item. Um, really big thanks to Ali and the team for all the planned work that are, that's undertaken, all the reactive work that we have to undertake in a, quite a small team. I think it's absolutely fantastic um, products we're getting out of this. So thanks to Ali and the team. And if you have any feedback in relation to this report, please let us know. Oh, it's, well, it's good to have the report. First time we've actually seen it at a table like this. Well, first time I've seen it. Uh, yeah. So I don't know, what, what's your intention? Would you update this for subsequent meetings? Or? Yes, I would. Okay. I'd try and update that um, in a way that's easy to see changes. Um, it's hard, the first schedule process does take some time, so sometimes you won't see a lot of change with um, particular reports, but yeah, as we go forward, and as we make um, things operative, we can show that for you. Excellent, thank you. Well, I'd like to move that we note the contents of this report and uh, note the updates on timing and progress on projects undertaken by the planning and policy team. A second, Matt, second, all in favour? Carried. Thank you very much, Alison, and your team. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'd like to move that, well, I will move that the public be excluded from the meeting. Someone said, bless a second, all in favour? Okay. Oh, the public, out they go. <laughs> <coughs> Streaming out the door. <laughs> <laughs>